Jesse Levinson, founder and CTO of Zooks. You founded the company in July 2014, which is a little while ago. A lot's happened in that time. If you live in San Francisco, you'll recognize the Zooks test vehicles. You've been acquired by Amazon, and now we have this vehicle sitting over your shoulder. What is it? So we're very proud that we can finally share this vehicle with the world. We've been working on this for about six years now, and this is the world's first ground up robo taxi that's designed to move people around cities, and it actually drives. Talk to me about some of its capabilities. How fast can it travel? How strong? How, what is the range in the battery pack? Things like that. So I think some people imagine that these vehicles can maybe only go up to 25 miles an hour, only drive for a few hours, but we've architected and engineered this vehicle to go up to 75 miles an hour in both directions and last a full day and night on a single charge. What a lot of people might recognize in autonomous test vehicles are cars that are retrofitted with sensor suites. The sensor suites on this vehicle are clearly visible, but, but they're there deliberately. Talk to me about what I'm looking at right now. What are those sensor pods on each corner, what do they do? So what you see on the top corner of the vehicle, on every single corner, is what we call a sensor pod, and it contains cameras and LiDAR that see 207 degrees of the world. And because we have one on each corner, not only can we see the entire world around us in 360 degrees, but we have overlap and redundancy. So we can see around objects, and if any sensor fails, we still have 360 degree coverage and we can finish our mission. How much of a breakthrough is this compared to the Zooks test vehicle that we see on the roads today? So in some ways it's very similar because it has the same sensor architecture and compute and software, but underneath it all, the vehicle itself is completely different. It has far more capabilities, much better redundancy, and much, much more precise controllability. How did you arrive at this design? Why does it look like that? So we wanted to create a vehicle that was friendly and approachable, very comfortable and spacious on the inside, but as small and compact as possible on the exterior so that it was as maneuverable as possible in dense urban environments. Talk to me about the battery pack, about charging. What are the specs of the battery pack? How does charging work? So we put a very large battery in this vehicle. Actually, we put two. So there's a battery under each seat, and in total, they have 133 kilowatt hours of energy, which allows us to drive all day and all night long on a single charge. This is a bi-directional vehicle. It can travel both ways. Sometimes that's the front, sometimes the back. Explain to me why, why you've done this and how, how it works. So as far as we know, this is the world's first and only truly bi-directional vehicle. And it turns out that if you don't have to drive it with a person, there's really no reason why you wouldn't want to make it be able to drive both ways. It makes the vehicle very maneuverable because you have four-wheel steering with an incredibly tight turning radius. And if you ever get stuck, you can just flip your lights and go the other way. And when you pick up a passenger, you don't have to do three-point or five-point turns, so you make your route planning much more efficient. You're not the first to do this. Cruise has its Origin Shuttle as an example. There are other startups with sort of smaller shuttle type autonomous vehicles out there. What differentiates this one? So several things are unique to our vehicle. First of all, unlike many of the concept cars that uh, other companies have shown over the last several years, this vehicle has passed all the FMVSS crash tests and it can drive up to 75 miles an hour in both directions. And we are driving it autonomously in actual scenarios with other agents. What are you most proud of around this vehicle? So we had this unusual vision in 2014 to really change the way people move around cities. And at the time, we were somewhat ridiculed for doing something so ambitious and so strange. Uh, what I'm so proud of now is that when people see this vehicle and when they experience it, it doesn't feel strange at all. In fact, to the contrary, it really feels like the most natural thing in the world, and we're very proud of that. When you and I met earlier in the year and took a ride in one of the test vehicles, the world was a very different place. How have you had to adjust during the pandemic from an engineering standpoint to get this done? So it's definitely been a challenge to safely build and assemble these vehicles and test them with COVID going on. Uh, we've had to reduce a little bit of the volumes on our manufacturing floor, and we've had to, of course, socially distance everybody. Uh, but fundamentally, this vehicle is designed to be driven without a driver. And so in some ways, we're very lucky because testing it without a driver is a very safe thing to do uh, in COVID times. If I'm a consumer, I'm standing by the side of the road and I want to hail one of your vehicles, I go on the app, I request a ride, 
What happens next? How does the vehicle respond to that and navigate to that consumer? So one of the great things for consumers is they're not really going to have to learn any new skills or behaviors to use our vehicles. Because if you're used to ride hailing, it's very similar. You take out your app, you say, I'd like to get a Zooks, and then it just comes and finds you. And because your phone knows where you are with its GPS sensor, uh, we can cross-reference that to our own maps, and the vehicle can come to almost exactly where you are. What are the safety nets? What redundancy is there in the event of an emergency, or if the vehicle is non-responsive, or simply put, if, if a rider is worried and wants to get out of the vehicle? So we've built in literally over 100 safety features into our vehicle, and part of that as well is having several layers of redundancy. So there are sensors in every corner, so that if any sensor fails, we still have 360 degree coverage. There are multiple layers of compute systems, so if any compute system fails, the vehicle can still drive safely, or worst case, come to a safe stop. There are humans in the loop, so if the vehicle ever finds itself in a situation where it's not entirely sure what to do, a remote human can give it assistance. Teleoperation you're talking about. That's exactly right, teleoperation. And finally, there is a button on either side of the vehicle on the interior, so if a passenger is ever concerned, they can press the button and the vehicle will come to the safest possible stop as soon as possible. There are other vehicles in the world where you have passengers facing each other, perhaps traveling backwards, but one of the things that is a concern is what happens in the event of a crash. Talk to me about how the vehicle responds in the event that there was some kind of crash or collision. So the good news is we should almost never be in crashes because the AI system is so sophisticated. However, we do have to be prepared for the possibility that there is a crash, particularly because we can't always guarantee that nobody else will run into our vehicle. So we've taken the opportunity to build the world's safest vehicle for all four occupants. Because of our symmetry, we are able to get five-star crash safety for every single occupant in the vehicle, and that's never been done in a passenger vehicle before. You've obviously got your work cut out for you, you and Aisha, to get the commercial application on the ground into the real world. But that is your work, you know, that's the end result. So what, what comes next for you? What are you going to be working on? How do you improve the product? What are the, is most of your gonna, time going to be spent doing over the next 12 months? So most of our time in the next couple of years is going to be really refining and quantifying the safety of the vehicle so that we can convince not only ourselves but the public that our service is significantly safer than a human driver because that's the bar that we're setting for ourselves before we put these on public roads. Jesse Levinson, Zook, founder, CTO, thank you very much for having us. Thank you for being here today.